We're starting a new unit now on predicate logic. Predicate logic is a system of symbolic logic that contains a bit more nuance than SL, which is the previous logical language that we learned. And the motivation behind us wanting to learn this new way of doing logic is because there are some valid arguments that can't be represented in SL. So there are a lot of limitations to that language. For instance, here's a valid argument um, that we make in English. All Pomeranians are angels, Prince is a Pomeranian, therefore Prince is an angel. Not only is this invalid argument, but it's a sound argument, and I'm going to insert a photo here so that we're all convinced of this argument's soundness. The problem is, though, is that we can't symbolize this argument in um, SL. Whoops, I should have a conclusion line there. Okay, so here's the best we can do at symbolizing this argument in SL. Because there are no logical connectives, in this argument, the best we can do is to represent each sentence as an atomic sentence. So we represent the first sentence with an A, the second sentence with a B, and the conclusion with a C. And this isn't a valid argument. It's possible for all the premises to be true and the conclusion false, namely when A and B are assigned true and C is assigned false. That's a perfectly acceptable truth assignment, and that demonstrates that this argument can't be represented as a valid argument in SL. Predicate logic, which is the logical system we're turning to now, is a language that allows us to represent arguments like this one because it retains three important kinds of subsentential components. Singular terms, um, singular terms are names like prince. Okay, so we're going to be able to say prince is a Pomeranian. Predicates. Predicates are kind of like incomplete sentences with gaps, so things like is a Pomeranian or is an angel. We're going to be talking about that in more detail. And also quantifiers. So PL is going to allow us to represent words like all and some, um, so things that express quantities. And in allowing us to um, retain singular terms, predicates, and quantifiers, PL is going to allow us to analyze arguments that can't be represented in SL. We're going to talk about each of these three substantial components in turn. Um, in this video, we're just going to talk about singular terms and predicates, and we're going to learn how to symbolize English sentences in PL without using quantifiers. That's what question one on the problem set asks for. So we're just going to first talk about singular terms and predicates. Okay, a singular term is any word or phrase that designates one thing. For instance, proper names designate just one thing. So Angela, for instance, designates me. There are many, many people named Angela in the world, but you can tell from the way that something is being used in this case, I'm clearly referring to myself. Um, so in that case, uh, the name Angela designates just one thing, me. Prince uh, is a name that designates my dog. Again, there are many dogs named Prince, but from context, we can tell that I'm just meaning to designate my dog Prince. Canada uh, designates just one thing, the country Canada. Okay, so those are just examples of proper names. Another kind of a singular term is a definite description. A definite description is a description of something that uses like the at the front, right? So it's a description of something, but it's meant to just pick out one thing. So the Tiger King, if you've been watching the show on Netflix, is Joe Exotic. So the phrase, the Tiger King, picks out just one thing. The Duchess of Sussex picks out just one thing, Meghan Markle. I, I wonder if Joe Exotic and Meghan Markle have ever been <laughs> referenced in the same breath. So... Who knows? We're breaking all sorts of records right now. This is really amazing that we're doing that. Okay, <laughs> um, so definite descriptions can be contrasted with phrases that use like a. So if you say like a chair in the room, that's not a definite description because it could be picking out any chair in the room. Versus if you said the chair in the room, that would pick out just one thing. That's a definite description. Okay, the third kind of singular term is a pronoun used in place of a proper name or a definite description. For instance, the she in this sentence, Angela turned on Netflix and she watched Tiger King. The she there is just meant to be a placeholder for the proper name Angela. So we would treat the she in that sentence as a singular term. Okay, so those are the three kinds of singular terms. Another uh, substantial component that PL allows us to retain are predicates. 
Predicates can be thought of as incomplete sentences that contain gaps, such that when those gaps are filled with singular terms, the result is a complete sentence. Predicates always have one or more places, and the number of places represents the number of gaps in the sentence that need to be filled with singular terms in order for the predicate to become a full sentence. Here's an example of a one-place predicate. X lives in Ann Arbor. So the X there needs to be filled in with a, a singular term like Angela, and that becomes a complete sentence. So Angela lives in Ann Arbor is a sentence, X lives in Ann Arbor is a predicate. Okay, here's an example of a two-place predicate, X lives in Y. So the X needs to be filled in with um, a name, and Y also needs to be filled in with a name. Uh, X probably will be filled in with like a name of a person and Y with the name of a place. There are also three place predicates. So uh, you could say that should be a colon, not a comma. X and Y live in Z. Um, so we could say uh, like, you know, X and Y should be filled in with names of people and Z with the name of a place. Um, so again, the number of places just represents the number of names that need to be filled into the predicate in order for it to be a full sentence, etc., etc. Right? We can have four place predicates, five place predicates, um, as many as you want. Okay, those are singular terms and predicates. We need to talk about just one other thing before we get started um, symbolizing sentences of English into sentences of PL, and that's the idea of a universe of discourse. A universe of discourse refers to the set of things that we're talking about when we're doing a symbolization. Often when we're doing symbolizations, the universe of discourse is going to be super broad. So it'll be something like all the people in the world, or all the currently living people, or all the countries in the world. Um, it might also be all the people who attend the University of Michigan. Um, so often it's not going to be like clearly delineated exactly like who is in the set, but right now we're just going to deal with cases where we have a finite set uh, that constitutes our universe of discourse. So in this case, let's say we're the universe of discourse, the only things we're talking about are a set of friends, um, and the set contains four objects, Angela, which we'll refer to using a lowercase a, Izzy, which we'll refer to using a lowercase i, Rebecca, which we'll refer to using lowercase r, and Vicky, which is a lowercase v. So these are all names, right? These are the singular terms that we're dealing with, and we refer to each of them using a lowercase Roman letter. Okay, so in our symbolization key, we have our universe of discourse, and we also have a list of predicates. So predicates get designated with a capital Roman letter. So uh, in the example that follows, um, we're going to uh, be dealing with um, four predicates, two one-place predicates, actually three one-place predicates. That's a typo. This should be PX. So PX is X gets a new phone number. Okay, so that's a symbolization key for PL. You need to specify the universe of discourse, which contains um, either like a description of the set you're talking about, so like all the currently living people, or a very clearly delineated set, um, and all of the predicates that you're using. Okay, now that we know what our universe of discourse is and we have our symbolization key, we're ready to do some symbolizations. Let's start with an easy one. So say we want to symbolize Angela goes to UM. What we do is we find the predicate that we want. So in this case, it's MX, that's M goes to UM. And then we're going to replace the X with the name that we want to be filled in into the predicate. So we would write MA. So this says Angela goes to Michigan. Okay, now let's go to number two. Izzy, Rebecca, and Vicky moved to New York. This is actually saying three different sentences, right? It's saying Izzy goes to New York and Rebecca moves to New York and Vicky moves to New York. So how we would represent that is, is we would find the corresponding predicate for moves to New York, which is NX, and we're going to create a conjunction for each of those three sentences. So Izzy moves to New York, and Rebecca moves to New York, whoops, New York, and Vicky moves to New York. And then fill in the parentheses accordingly. 
Sometimes in PL, parentheses are going to get really annoying um, because sentences can get quite long. Um, I'm going to be less strict about whether uh, sentence parentheses are used like 100% correctly. As long as there's no ambiguity in what's being written, it's okay if there's some missing parentheses. Um, that'll become clearer as we sort of begin working with longer sentences. But in general, we should keep in the habit of doing parentheses correctly to avoid any ambiguity. Okay, now let's uh, symbolize the sentence, at least one friend goes to UM. We're not allowed to use quantifiers yet, so all we can use are our predicates and our names. So how would we symbolize at least one, friends go at least one friend goes to UM? Well, one way to symbolize it is just to write a disjunction where um, we say Angela goes to UM or Izzy goes to UM or Rebecca or Vicky. And in order for that disjunction to be true, it must be the case that at least one of them goes to UM. It's okay if more than one of them goes to UM, the disjunction would still be true, but it guarantees that at least one of them goes to UM. So let's write that out. So uh, goes to UM is MX, so we'll write Angela goes to UM or Izzy goes to UM or Rebecca goes to UM, or Vicky goes to UM. And then fill in the parentheses accordingly. Okay, so again, this guarantees that at least one friend goes to UM. The only way that this sentence is false is if no friends go to UM, which is exactly what we wanted. Whenever you see um, a sentence that's quantified with like at least one, um, you know you're going to want to do an iterated disjunction. Okay, so you know you're going to want to have like the disjunction sign in there somewhere. Um, so this is how you write at least one. It's a different story for at least two. Um, I'll leave uh, you, <laughs> I'll leave that to you to figure out as an exercise. Okay, so at least one or at least blank, you know you're going to want to have an iterated disjunction of some kind. Okay, number four, if Angela doesn't go to UM, she'll move to New York. So if Angela doesn't go to UM, if not MA, then she'll move to New York. So the she here is a pronoun that's um, holding the place of a name, Angela. So we would just replace the she with Angela. So if Angela doesn't go to UM, then she'll move to New York. Okay, next sentence. If Angela goes to UM, then she'll live in a different city than all her friends. Here we have another quantified word, right? There's all. What that is saying is it's getting us to see the following thing, right? We're not allowed to use quantifiers, so here's how we would symbolize that sentence. We want to say if Angela goes to UM, so if MA, then she'll live in a different city than Rebecca, and she'll live in a different city than Izzy, and she'll live in a different city than Victoria. So again, we have three different sentences that we want to um, uh, what, what, that that we want to symbolize. Okay. So how do what's the predicate for lives in a different city? Well, we have a predicate for lives in the same city. So lives in a different city is going to be the negation of that sentence. So here's how we would symbolize it. If Angela goes to UM, then it's not the case that Angela will live in the same city as Izzy, and it's not the case that Angela will live in the same city as Rebecca, and it's not the case that Angela will live in the same city as Victoria. Okay, so notice how up here when we had the quantified term at least one, we did an iterated disjunction, and down here, when we have the term all, we're doing an iterated conjunction. Okay, so those are the two key things um, that are gonna be really helpful for you to know on the problem set. So let's do one final one that involves a bit more finesse. We wanna translate the sentence, if Angela and Izzy go to UM, and it actually doesn't make sense to say Izzy there, let's say Rebecca, okay. And Rebecca and Victoria move to New York, then at most two of them, will get new numbers. Okay, so let's symbolize the antecedent first. So if Angela and Izzy go to UM, that's saying if Angela goes to UM and Izzy goes to UM, okay, that's the first part of our antecedent, and Rebecca moves to New York and Victoria moves to New York, 
Okay, and now we're ready for the antecedent. How are we going to symbolize at most two of them will get new phone numbers? Well, at most two means it could be two, but it could also be one, or it could also be zero, right? All we know is that two of them will not, not get it for sure, right? So two of them for sure will not get new numbers. Beyond that, we have no idea. So here's how we symbolize that. We would say um, that it's not the case that for any two combination of people, once we um, put uh, make that into an iterated disjunction, then one of those disjuncts must be true. Okay, so here's what I mean by that. Let's create every possible combination of negated um, pairs of uh, where the names get filled in with into this predicate. So Angela doesn't get a new number and Izzy doesn't get a new number or Angela doesn't get a new number and Rebecca doesn't get a new number or uh, Angela doesn't get a new number and Victoria doesn't get a new number. Okay, what else are we missing? Or uh, we don't have Izzy and Rebecca together. So not PI and not PR. Or we don't have Victoria and Rebecca. So, oh, whoops. So not PR and not PV. And we're missing one more. Or not... I think we're missing, what are we missing? Rebecca and Izzy? No, we have Rebecca and Izzy. We're missing Izzy and Victoria. Not P-I and not P-V. Okay, so this is one of the times where I'm going to be lazy about my parentheses, okay? I'm not going to, <laughs> it's just like too stressful to like get that to work. Okay, so what this says in the consequent, right? So over here, that says that it can never be the case, um, it, it must be the case that two people don't get new numbers. And beyond that, we don't know, right? And we don't know who, which two people are, going, are not going to get new numbers, but we do know that it's going to be one combination of these, okay? And so the conditions under which this is true gets us exactly what we wanted to symbolize. So cases where you want to get a specific number right? Like if you want to get like at most two and you're not allowed to use quantifiers can get a little tricky, um, but it, it's pretty fun to like figure out. So just like treat it like a puzzle. Um, and remember that um, thinking about when iterated disjunctions are going to be helpful and when iterated conjunctions are going to be helpful is really going to um, help you work through the problem set.